Chapter 15 What about the gun? Abraham said as we walked. The bank, the fault contents, those can be a false lead, could they not? What if there was something special about the gun that your father fired at him? That gun was dropped by a random security officer. I said, Smith & Wesson, M&P, 9mm, semi-auto. There was nothing special about it. You remember the exact gun? I kicked a bit of trash as we walked through the steel-walled under underground tunnel. As I said, I remember that day. Besides, I know guns. I hesitated, then admitted more. When I was young, I assumed the type of gun must have been special. I saved up, planning to buy one, but nobody would sell to a kid my age. I was planning to see sneak into the palace and shoot him. Sneak into the palace, Abraham said flatly. Uh, yes. And shoot Steelheart. I was ten, I said. Give me a little credit. To a boy with aspirations like that, I would extend my respect, but not credit. Or life insurance. Abraham sounded amused. You are an interesting man, David Charleston, but you sound like you are an even more interesting child. I smiled. There was something invitingly friendly about this soft-spoken, articulate Canadian with his light French accent. You almost didn't notice the enormous machine gun, with mounted grenade launcher, resting on his shoulder. We were still in the steel catacombs, where even such high, a high level of armament didn't d draw particular attention. We passed occasional groups of people huddled around burning fires or heaters plugged into pirated electric jacks. More than a few of the people we passed car carried assault rifles. Over the last few days, I'd ventured out of the hideout a couple of times, always in the company of one of the other reckoners. The babysitting bothered me, but I got it. I couldn't exactly hope for them to trust me yet. Not completely. Besides, though I would never admit it out loud, I didn't want to walk the steel catacombs alone. I'd avoided these depths for years. At the factory, they told stories about the depraved people, terrible monsters, who lived down here. Gangs that literally fed on the foolish who wandered into forgotten hallways, killing them and feasting on their flesh. Murderers, criminals, addicts. Not the normal sort of criminals and addicts we had up above, either. Specially depraved ones. Perhaps those were exaggerations. The people we passed did seem dangerous, but more in a hostile way, not in an insane way. They watched with grim expressions and eyes that tracked your every movement until you passed out of their view. These people wanted to be alone. They were the outcasts of outcasts. Why does he let them live down here? I asked as we passed another group. Megan didn't respond. She was walking ahead of us, keeping to herself. But Abraham glanced over his shoulder, looking toward the firelight and the line of people who had stepped up to make sure we left. There will always be people like them, Abraham said. Steelheart knows it. Tia, she thinks he made this place for them, so he would know where they were. It is useful to know where your outcasts are gathering. Better the ones you know about than the ones you cannot anticipate. That made me uncomfortable. I'd thought we were completely out of Steelheart's view down here. Perhaps this place wasn't as safe as I'd assumed. You cannot keep all men confined all of the time, Abraham said, not without creating a strong prison. So instead, you allow some measure of freedom for those who really, really want it. That way, they do not become rebels, if you do it right. He did it wrong with us, I said softly. Yes, yes indeed he did. I kept glancing back as we walked. I couldn't shake the worry that some of those in the catacombs would, atta would attack us. They never did, though. They... I started as I realized at that moment that some of them were following us. Abraham, I said softly. They're following. Yes, he said calmly. There are some waiting for us ahead, too. In front of us, the tunnel narrowed. Sure enough, a group of shadowed figures were standing there, waiting. They wore the mismatched cast-off clothing common to many catacombers, and they carried old rifles and pistols wrapped in leather. 
the types of guns that probably only worked one day out of two and had been carried by a dozen different people over the last ten years. The three of us stopped walking, and the group behind caught up, boxing us in. I couldn't see their faces. None carried mobiles, and it was dark without their glow. That's some nice equipment, friend, said one of the figures in the group in front of us. Nobody made any overtly hostile moves. They held their weapons with the barrels pointed to the sides. I carefully started to unsling my gun, my heart racing. Abraham, however, laid a hand on my shoulder. He carried his massive machine gun in the other hand, barrel pointed upward, and wore one of the Reckoner jackets, like Megan, though his was grey and white, with a high collar and several pockets, while hers was standard brown leather. They always wore their jackets when they left the hideout. I'd never seen one work, and I didn't know how much protection they could realistically offer. Be still, Abraham said to me. But I will deal with this, he said, his voice perfectly calm as he took a step forward. Megan stepped up beside me, hand on the holster of her pistol. She didn't look any calmer than I was, both of us trying to watch the people ahead and behind us at once. You like our equi equipment? Abraham said politely. You should leave the guns, the thug said. Continue on. This would not make any sense, Abraham said. If I have weapons that you want, the implication is that my firepower is greater than yours. If we were to fight, you would lose. You see? Your intimidation, it does not work. There are more of us than you, friend, the guy said softly. And we're ready to die. Are you? I felt a chill at the back of my neck. No, these weren't the murderers I had been led to believe lived down here. They were something more dangerous, like a pack of wolves. I could see it in them now, in the way they moved, in the way the groups of them had watched us pass. These were outcasts, but outcasts who had banded together to become one. They no longer lived as individuals, but as a group. And for this group, guns like the ones Abraham and Megan carried would increase their chances of survival. They'd take them, even if it meant losing some of their numbers. It looked to be about a dozen men and women against just three, and we were surrounded. They were terrible odds. I itched to lower my rifle and start shooting. You didn't ambush us, Abraham pointed out. You hoped to be able to end this without death. The thieves didn't reply. It is very kind of you to offer us this chance, Abraham said, nodding to them. There was a strange sincerity to Abraham. From another person, words like those might have sounded condescending or sarcastic. But from him, they sounded genuine. You have let us pass several times through territory you consider to be your own. For this also, I give you my thanks. The guns, the thug said. I cannot give them to you, Abraham said. We need them. Beyond this, if we were to give them to you, it would go poorly for you and yours. Others would see them and desire them. Other gangs would seek to take them from you, as you have sought to take them from us. That isn't for you to decide. Perhaps not. However, in respect of the honor you have shown us, I will offer you a deal. A duel between you and me. Only one man need to be shot. If we win, you will leave us be, and allow us to pass freely through this area in future. If you win, my friends will deliver up their weapons, and you may take from my body that which you wish. These are st the steel catacombs, the man said. Some of his comp companions were sh whispering now, and he glared at them with shadowed eyes, then continued, This is not a place of deals. And yet you already offered us one, Abraham said calmly. You did us honor. I trust that you will show it to us again. It didn't seem to be about honor to me. They hadn't ambushed us because they were afraid of us. They wanted the weapons, but they didn't want to fight. They aimed to intimidate us instead. The lead thug, however, finally nodded. Fine, he said. A deal. Then he quickly raised his rifle and fired. The bullet hit Abraham right in the chest. I jumped, cursing as I scrambled for my gun. 
but Abraham didn't fall. He didn't even twitch. Two more shots cracked in the narrow tunnel, bullets hitting him, one in the leg, one in the shoulder. Ignoring his powerful machine gun, he calmly reached to his side and took his handgun out of its holster, then shot the thug in the thigh. The man cried out, dropping his battered rifle and collapsing, holding his wounded leg. Most of the others seemed too shocked to respond, though a few lowered their weapons nervously. Abraham casually reholstered his pistol. I felt sweat trickle down my brow. The jacket seemed to be doing its job and doing it better than I'd assumed. But I didn't have one of those things yet. If the other thugs opened fire... Abraham handed his machine gun to Megan, then walked forward and knelt beside the fallen thug. Place pressure here, please he said in a friendly tone, positioning the man's hand on his thigh. There, very good. Now, if you don't mind, I'll bandage the wound. I shot you where the bullet could pass through the muscle, so it wouldn't get lodged inside. The thug groaned at the pain as Abraham took out a bandage and wrapped the leg. You cannot kill us, friend, Abraham continued, speaking more softly. We are not what you taught us to be. Do you understand? The thug nodded vigorously. It would be wise to be our allies, do you not think? Yes, the thug said. Wonderful, Abraham replied, tying the bandage tight. Change that twice a day. Use boiled bandages. Yes. Good. Abraham stood and took his gun back and turned to the rest of the thug's group. Thank you for letting us pass, he said to the others. They looked confused, but parted, creating a path for us. Abraham walked forward, and we followed in a hurry. I looked over my shoulder as the rest of the gang gathered around their fallen leader. That was amazing, I said as we got farther away. No, it was a group of frightened people, defending what little they can lay claim to, their reputation. I feel bad for them. They shot you three times. I gave him permission. Only after they threatened us. And only after we violated their territory, Abraham said. He handed his machine gun to Megan again, then took off his jacket as he walked. I could see that one of the bullets had penetrated it. Blood was seeping out around a hole in his shirt. The jacket didn't stop them all. They aren't perfect, Megan said as Abraham took off the shirt. Mine fails all the time. We stopped as Abraham cleaned the wound with a handkerchief, then pulled out a little shard of metal. It was all that was left of the bullet, which apparently had disintegrated upon hitting his jacket. Only one little shard had made it through to his skin. What if he'd shot you in the face? I asked. The jackets hide an advanced shielding device, Abraham said. It isn't the jacket itself that protects, really but the field to jacket extends. It offers some protection for the entire body, an invisible variable, barrier to resist force. What? Really? That's amazing. Yes. Abraham hesitated, then pulled his shirt back on. It probably would not have stopped a bullet to the face, however, so I am fortunate they did not shoot, choose to shoot me there. As I said, Megan interjected, they are far from perfect. She seemed annoyed with Abraham. The shield works better with things like falls and crashes. Bullets are so small and hit with so much velocity, the shields overload quickly. Any of those shots could have killed you, Abraham. But they did not. You still could have been hurt. Megan's voice was stern. I was hurt. She rolled her eyes. You could have been hurt worse. Orte could have opened fire, he said, and killed us all. It was a gamble that worked. Besides, I believe to now think we are epics. I almost thought you were one, I admitted. Normally we keep this technology hidden, Abraham said, putting on his jacket again. People cannot wonder whether the Reckoners are epics. It would undermine what we stand for. However, in this case, I believe it will go well for us. Your plan calls for there to be rumors of new epics in the city, working against Steelheart. These men will hopefully spread that rumor. I guess, I said. 
It was a good move, Abraham, but sparks. For a moment, I thought we were all dead. People rarely want to kill, David, Abraham said calmly. It's not basic to the makeup of the healthy human mind. In most situations, they will go to great lengths to avoid killing. Remember that, and it will help you. I've seen a lot of people kill, I replied. Yes, and that will tell you something. Either they felt they had no choice, in which case, if you could give them another choice, they would have likely taken it, or they were not of healthy mind. And epics? Abraham reached to his neck and fingered the small, smil small silver necklace he wore there. Epics are not human. I nodded. With that, I agreed. I believe our conversation was interrupted, Abraham said, taking his gun from Megan and casually resting it on his shoulders as we walked onward. How did Steelheart get wounded? It could have been the weapon your father used. You never tried your brave plan of finding an identical gun than doing, what was it you said? Sneaking into Steelheart's palace and shooting him? No, I didn't get to try it, I said, blushing. I came to my senses. I don't think it was the gun, though. M and P 9 millimeters aren't that uncommon. Someone's got to have tried shooting him with one. Besides, I've never heard of an epic whose weakness was being shot by a specific caliber of bullet or make of gun. Perhaps, Abraham said, but many epic weaknesses do not make sense. It could have had something to do with that specific gun manufacturer, or instead it could have had something to do with the composition of the bullet. Many epics are weak to specific alloys. True, I admitted. But what would be different about that particular bullet that wasn't the same for all the others fired at, at him? I don't know, Abraham said, but it is worth considering. What do you think caused his weakness? Something in the vault, like the, Tia thinks, I said, with only so, a small measure of confidence. Either that or something about the situation. Maybe my father's specific age let him get through. Weird, I know, but there was an epic in Germany who could only be hurt by someone who was 37 exactly. Or maybe it was the number of people firing on him. Crossmark, an epic down in Mexico, can only be hurt if five people are trying to kill her at once. It doesn't matter, Megan interrupted, turning around in the hallway and stopping in the tunnel to look at us. You're never going to figure it out. His weakness could be virtually anything. Even with David's little story, assuming he didn't just make it up, there's no way of knowing. Abraham and I stopped in place. Megan's face was red, and she seemed barely in control. After a week of her acting cold and professional, her anger was a big shock. She spun around and kept walking. I glanced at Abraham, and he shrugged. We continued on, but our conversation died. Megan quickened her pace when Abraham tried to catch up to her, and so we just left her to it. Both she and Abraham had been given directions to the weapons merchant, so she could guide us just as well as he could. Apparently this diamond fellow was only going to be in town for a short time, and when he came, he always set up shop in a different location. We walked for a good hour through the twisting maze of catacombs before Megan stopped us at an intersection her mobile illuminating her face as she checked the map Tia had uploaded to it. Abraham took his mobile off the shoulder of his jacket and did the same. Almost there, he told me, pointing. This way, at the end of the tunnel. How well do we trust this guy? I asked. Not at all, Megan said. Her face had returned to its normal, impassive mask. Abraham nodded. Best to never trust weapons merchant, my friend. They sell to both sides, and they're the only ones who win if a conflict continues indefinitely. Both sides? I asked. He sells to Steelheart, too? He won't admit it if you ask, Abraham said. But it is certain that he does. Even Steelheart knows not to harm a good weapons dealer. Kill or torture a man like Diamond and future merchants won't come here. Steelheart's army will never have good technology compared to the neighbors. That's not saying that Steelheart likes it. Diamond, he could never open his shop up in the overstreets. 
Down here, however, Steelheart will turn a blind eye, so long as his soldiers continue to get their equipment. So, whatever we buy from him, I said, Steelheart will know about it. <laughs> no, no, Abraham said. He seemed amused, as if I were asking questions about something incredibly simple, like the rules to hide and seek. Weapons merchants don't talk about other clients, Megan said, as long as those clients live, at least. Diamond arrived back in the city just yesterday, Abraham said, leading the way down the tunnel. He will be open for one week's time. If we are first to get to him, we can see what he has before Steelheart's people do. We can get an advantage to way, eh? Diamond, he often has very interesting wares. All right, then, I thought. I guess it didn't matter that Diamond was slime. I'd use any tool I could get to steal heart. Moral considerations had stopped bothering me years ago. Who had time for morals in a world like this? We reached the corridor leading to Diamond's shop. I expected guards, perhaps in full-powered armor. The only person there, though, was a young girl in a yellow dress. She was lying on a blanket on the floor and drawing pictures on a piece of paper with a silver pen. She looked up at us and began chewing on the end of the pen. Abraham politely handed the girl a small data chip, which she took and examined for a moment before tapping it on the side of her mobile. We are with Phaedrus, Abraham said. We have an appointment. Go on, the girl answered, tossing the chip back to him. Abraham snatched it from the air and we continued down the corridor. I glanced over my shoulder at the girl. That's not very strong security. It's always something new with Diamond, Abraham said, smiling. There's probably something elaborate behind the scenes. Some kind of trap the girl can spring. It probably has to do with explosives. Diamond likes explosives. We turned a corner and stepped into heaven. Here we are, Abraham announced.